Greetings, everyone. I want to thank everyone to the podcast webinar series of the Middle East Forum, uh, where we talk about our Middle East Forums project. My name is Dexter Van Zyl, and I am the editor of Focus on Western Islamism, and I will be moderating this discussion today. Today's guest is Majid Mohammadi. Dr. Mohammadi is a writer, media analyst, and online teacher. A native of Iran, he is a regular guest on Persian language media where he communicates directly with Iranians in Iran, but providing them with perspectives on Islamism and card events. He holds a Bachelor of Science from Shiraz University, a Master's of Arts from Tehran University, and a PhD from Stony Brook University here in the United States. He's been kind enough to write several articles about Iranian-backed Islamism in the West for focus on Western Islamism. And today we're going to be talking about the confrontation between the Iranian regime and human rights activists in the Iranian diaspora in the West. One of the reasons why I, I'm so glad to have his writings uh, in our uh, publication is because uh, basically he gives a, a, a factual sense for optimism, and it's not all like, and what we can do to actually counter Islamism. Uh, as you, if you've seen, uh, uh, Dr. Mohammadi's writings in a uh, publication, you'll see that the Islamic Republic has promoted Islamism in the West for decades. And of late, two counter developments are underway. First, the Iranian diaspora has organized against these regime efforts that we found so troublesome. And secondly, uh, it, uh, we've seen efforts to strengthen uh, the, re the re internal opposition to the regime in Iran. Now, what has changed in the diaspora, and who, what are its leading figures and institutions, and how effective they might be? So it's just wonderful to have you with us today, Dr. Mohammadi. Can you talk just very briefly about how you became a critic of the regime? How did you go from being a student in Iran to uh, a, you know, a part of the, the dissident community here in the U.S.? Uh, thank you for having me, Dexter. Uh... From the age of uh, 16 to 20, I was a revolutionary. I was on the streets uh, chanting uh, slogans against the uh, Pahlavi regime. But uh, at the age of 20, I was dehallucinated. Uh, for two, three years, I went, uh, when the uh, universities were closed, I went to home seminary to learn uh, Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic philosophy, interpretation of Quran, uh, to learn what is there, what, what is the tradition. Uh, for some years, so in terms of ideology, at the age of 20, it was gone. But I was a, a Muslim. I was uh, praying five times a day, fasting, uh, till the age of 28. But at that age, I reached to this uh, conclusion that uh, religion is not for me, but I'm not against religion. So I respect anybody who uh, prays and fasts, but I'm uh, totally against the ideology because I have felt the results of this ideology in people's lives. I have uh, lost many of my friends during college uh, to the war between Iran and Iraq, uh, to the activism. Some of them were executed. They were leftists. They were close, we were close friends. And uh, also on the other side, I lost some uh, friends uh, from the uh, Islamist uh, side. So uh, from the age of 28, I have been writing and uh, I was involved in many uh, activities that were against the regime. Uh, so uh, I was dismissed uh, from the university that I was teaching for five years. That was radio and TV uh, college. Uh, then I was living a, a kind of underground life. So I couldn't publish my books. I couldn't do any research, no institutions in Iran. Uh, work with me, uh, but when Khatami came to uh, power in 1997, there was two years of change a little bit. I could publish some of my books. I could uh, write for some newspapers, 
but uh, the uh, killing of uh, dissidents and activists and putting in jail, jail came about. So I decided to uh, immigrate uh, to the US. So I was accepted to uh, Stony Brook University. And from then I have been uh, trying to do um, uh, a lot of things at the same time, teaching, uh, writing for uh, websites, giving interviews, uh, a lot of things that I believe that could uh, participate in uh, this huge movement that is against Islamism. In, in When I was 28, there was not a movement in Iran against Islamism. There was a reformist movement and people were trying to reform Islam. But after the crackdown on reform movement, uh, in about 1998, 1999, uh, it was the beginning of the uh, establishment of this anti-Islamist movement, and it has been growing uh, bigger and bigger. Who are the leading figures and institutions in the, the dissident community in the Iranian diaspora? And how effective do you think they're going to be in the long run? Uh, I believe there are three uh, categories, three branches. The leftist, Marxist, socialist. Nowadays, they are uh, some of them are feminist, wokeist. Uh, they have been uh, shrinking, and they are not leading anything. Uh, even in this movement, they have been silent in the last uh, six, seven months. Nowadays, they are coming out of their holes. They are talking against uh, Prince Reza Pahlavi. They are talking against uh, people who, uh, who are secular and they are going to dismantle the uh, Islamist ideology in the country and outside the country. Uh, the other branch is the reformed reformist uh, Islamist. Uh, now they are talking against the government. They don't want it uh, uh, to survive, uh, but some of them still have, they are uh, in the shadows of their past. Uh, did, did, uh, maybe Abdul Karim Surush and people like him, uh, they are trying to be different, but in some moments they go back to what they were before. And the third one that is growing uh, are regular people. They are in, in, the, in the U.S., most of the Iranian uh, immigrants, I call them social immigrants. They are not economic uh, or uh, some of them are ref political refugees, but most of them are social immigrants. They, uh, they were tired of enforcing Sharia in public. They were tired of Islamization process. So they immigrated to West to have a real and regular life. These people are joining the anti-Islamist movement. Now this movement uh, that is going on in Iran for eight months, uh, it, it's totally an anti-Islamist movement. It's not, uh, more, maybe some leftists present it as a, a uh, economic uh, kind of uh, movement, uh, right to have it uh, have bread or uh, residence. It's not. It's the, the whole movement is against Islamism. In the last eight months, I have never heard an economic slo slogan. I have never heard uh, in Iran, inside the country, uh, never heard a slogan against Israel, nothing about US, nothing about imperialism. This is a totally different movement. And you have the reflection of that movement here in the US and Europe. 95% of the uh, Iranians who live abroad, according to a, a poll, they don't want this regime because of its nature, that is uh, Islamism. Now, one of the things that we have seen is, is that uh, Sam Westrup just wrote an article that appeared in uh, Focus on Western Islamism that said that essentially the leadership of the Islamist movement may appear in some instances to be migrating 
uh, here to the United States, uh, particularly in reference to South Asia. But it's almost as if now we're starting to see a very odd thing where we're seeing the leadership of the counter-Islamist movement basically existing in one of the most Islamist countries in the world. Where does the, the, uh, the inspiration flow? Does it flow from the United States into Iran uh, for the uh, counter-Islamist, or does it flow in the opposite direction or both? Does the inspiration flow maybe from Tehran, the protesters in Tehran, to Europe and North America, or the other way around? I believe it's both ways. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of people who are uh, inspiring people in Iran regarding anti-Islamist uh, movement. And in Iran, the young people, uh, people uh, in Iran they are called uh, people who were uh, born in 80s, uh, in uh, solar calendar, Iranian uh, solar calendar, uh, the Z generation. Uh, they are inspiring everybody in the U.S. and in Europe because they just want life, regular life. And they don't want uh, these uh, uh, people who are uh, ruling the country, uh, even for a moment. They were trying to get rid of it, but the, the, mov the movement didn't grow enough. Uh, according to some uh, government's uh, estimates, uh, Iranian governments, uh, between 600 to 700,000 people came to the street and they were active, they were not standing by. Uh, this was not enough because the regime has a huge uh, oppression machine and they could, uh, according to the head of the judiciary, they arrested more than 80,000 people. So imagine how big the oppression machine is. We are inspiring by them, uh, by their activism, and they are inspiring But what people in the US and Europe, they are uh, producing the thoughts, the uh, programs, the agenda that are uh, uh, spreading all over the country. From the beginning of this movement, Iranian diaspora have uh, has been pursuing five agendas. One, weakening and dismantling regimes lobby in the US and in Europe. Second, neutralizing regimes uh, propaganda tools such as Islamic centers and mosques. Third one, putting maximum pressure on uh, Western governments to isolate the regime. Four, uh, stop JCPOA revival negotiations uh, while asking for more sanctions. And fifth, enlisting IRGC as a terrorist organization and uh, sanction this uh, entity. The second and fifth agenda that is neutralizing regime propaganda and put IRGC on the uh, uh, terrorist list, it's uh, it has been the uh, main uh, agenda that people in Iran, you can see in their uh, slogans uh, about the uh, regime. Even, even people who go to uh, stadiums, yesterday it was uh, two main uh, soccer teams uh, playing against each other and it is called derby, like uh, what is going on in Europe. And people have been in uh, the uh, people who were in the stadium, the young people, they were chanting against IRGC. They were insulting them by bad uh, words. Uh, and it has been going on for uh, eight months. Uh, and on the other side, girls on the streets, they chant to the Basijis, to the Islamists, to the clergy that you are the pervert because they call uh, girls that do not wear hijab pervert or the slut. They say that you are, you are the pervert, you are the sluts. So these two uh, agenda is common between uh, Iranians inside and outside the country. And uh, I believe this could, uh, in, in Europe, 
there has been some uh, backlash. Uh, some uh, countries uh, declared that they will put uh, IRGC on their terror list, and then they refused to do that. Uh, but for the for the women's right, I believe this is a winner. Uh, women inside and Iranian di diaspora outside can push this agenda because it's a human rights issue and it will never end until women will be free to wear whatever they like in public. Now, it's clear that there's been kind of a galvanizing impact of the women, life, and freedom on the Iranian diaspora. But do you think that the diaspora is, and this question is coming from our audience, is the Iranian diaspora large enough and credible enough to have real influence, you think, on policymakers here in the West? 100%. In, uh, according to some estimates, there are five to seven million Iranians in Europe and North America. And it, and it is uh, growing. It's in, the, the number is increasing. Uh, all Iranians are very active in voting. They are uh, active in business. They are active in politics. They are active in culture. So they have a, uh, they will have a real impact. Yesterday in New York, uh, Iranian New York parade, Chuck Schumer was there, this, the mayor of the city was there, and a lot of, lot of uh, Congress people were there. So Iranians will have an impact. And now women life freedom movement is everywhere. The main theme of the parade yesterday that has been going on for about two decades is after no rules, Iranian New Year. The main theme was uh, women, life, freedom. All over the country, Iranians are active. They are calling uh, their uh, people in Congress. Most of the uh, events that Nayak uh, could have in the last eight months were canceled because of uh, Iranians who have been calling the uh, deans in universities, the organizers, and they canceled. In, in Stony Brook, uh, Trita Parsi, uh, there was uh, a meeting. Uh, he was going to give a lecture in the university two months ago. Two days after they declared, it was canceled because Iranians are active against this, uh, the regime and everything that relates to the regime. Now, one of the things that, you know, I was, in 2014, I saw an Al-Quds rally here in Boston, and I had a vague sense of what I was, was looking at. I didn't know, you know, I had a sense that, yes, this was an Iranian-sponsored event, but, but I didn't really understand just how much of an effort it was and how closely tied these events were to the Iranian regime to essentially disrupt the public life in Western democracies. And in, in the years after that, when we, I started to write about Nayak and Trita Parsi that you mentioned, I, I realized just the level of influence uh, and, and, and for lack of a better word, like the, you know, the, they used essentially our Western freedoms and our Western procedures against uh, us. Um, are, are you more, but now, I've seen a lot more pushback. Are you more optimistic now than you were maybe maybe 10 years ago? Uh, even one year ago. Uh, one year ago, you couldn't see uh, any of this activism by uh, Iranians uh, in North America and Europe. Now uh, you can have, uh, from this five to million uh, people, uh, Iranians abroad, at least 500 to 700,000 are active. They are on the streets. If you add all the people that uh, showed up in demonstrations, for example, in Berlin, about 100,000, in Toronto, 50,000, in a small cities in Australia, in Brisbane, 2,000, 3,000, some weeks, 5,000. So, these people, they are active. They are listening to the news. They are uh, sending messages. They are pushing celebrities. 
uh, Angelina Jolie, uh, all of these celebrities to react what happening. Uh, you, uh, if there was not uh, this activism, you couldn't hear anything about this movement because in the first two, three weeks of the movement, all media were silent because this movement was about freedom of uh, uh, clothing and it was against obligatory hijab. And the leftists in this country, they are praising hijab every day. Look at the uh, advertisements on TV. In every ad, ad you can see a woman uh, with hijab. I have nothing against that because if it's not sponsored by the government, if it's a business or it's civil society, I have nothing against that. But in this environment that Islamism is part of the identity politics, they, they, all of the media ignored it for two, three weeks. So by Iranian push everywhere, push on media, on celebrities, on uh, governments, now that the, the dynamic has changed, everything is changed. Uh, most of these, uh, for example, these uh, Quds, uh, rallies, most of them are canceled because the governments in uh, Canada, Germany, France, they don't want Iranians to get uh, involved, to get in clashes. Because if there is a uh, Quds rally in Toronto, thousands of Iranians will be there and there will be fighting. And because of this, they don't, uh, give license to these people to be on the streets and praise Khamenei and uh, chant against Israel. Now, I was a teenager when the Iranian hostage crisis took place. And, a, and I think a lot of Americans had essentially a monolithic view of Iran. They thought that the entire population didn't like us. And, and now we're starting to see that there's not you know, and I hate to use this word because it's such a cliche, but Iran is not a monolithic country and they're not behind the mullahs. Um, do you think that even like the Basiji or the IRGC and any of the other paramilitaries, do you think that in Iran, and this is kind of outside of FWY's purview, but do you think that there might be some people in those organizations that are starting to side with the people? Of course, there was a file uh, in, uh, I believe in uh, early January, it was uh, disclosed. Uh, Khamenei had a meeting with 80 uh, IRGC commanders and the high ranking officials in the uh, 16 uh, security institutions. Most of them are talking against killing people on the streets most of them are demoralized. And Khamenei and some, some of his very close uh, allies, they are talking against other commanders who are on the streets and they are oppressing people. It's the, I believe the whole system, the uh, propaganda machine and the oppression machines, two important machines of the government are demoralized. Islamism as an ideology in Iran is over. I assure you, it's just working because of the organization, because of the money that they will they receive, because of the rewards that all of these people are receiving, uh, people who are, who are connected to the regime. Regarding the real people who are on the streets, it's gone. Even women with hijab, with chador, they are going to, the, uh, to these rallies in Iran. They are supporting uh, small girls. And because of this regime is targeting schools. Uh, till today, I believe more than 500 schools are attacked. They, they have had uh, chemical attacks. More than 20,000 girls have been poisoned. Why uh, the government is doing this? Because it has lost its uh, social base. There is no social base 
for Islamism in Iran. And people who have lived this experience inside and outside the country, they are the best allies of people who are fighting against this Western Islamism because they know how Islamism works, how they try to uh, spread their words, how they try to organize. These are the best uh, ally of any anti-Islamism movement in the world. Okay, how can the average counter-Islamist, non-Iranian, assist the, uh, the, the diaspora, the dissident community in the Iranian diaspora? What can they do? This is what was done in the last eight months. Uh, Iranians began with public opinions. They didn't go to media because they knew that MSNBC or CNN or uh, NPR, they will ignore them. They began with public opinions. They put pressure on celebrities. Uh, so, some, of, some of these celebrities, for example, uh, uh, Kim Kardashian has hundreds of millions of followers. She, because of uh, a, a snowfall of uh, messages, she reacted and she uh, supported the, the movement. They began with public opinions and then from the public opinion, it went to the media and then from media to the uh, government officials. First, uh, the legislative bodies and then the executive bodies. The executive bodies are the last. For example, Biden administration, nobody in Iranian diaspora believe that we can ask uh, Biden administration to do something about this. They knew that the, the uh, chanting in front of the White House was Biden, wake up. They know that Biden is, uh, is asleep. Everybody knows. Nobody went to the uh, officials. And what they, what they said was totally irrelevant. Nobody cared in between Iranians, because I have been uh, in uh, different rallies and I have been uh, uh, following uh, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, uh, Instagram. Instagram uh, is more active because in Iran, a lot of people are uh, have accounts on Instagram. So I, I believe from these three layers, public opinion, media, and then uh, officials, if anti-Islamism movement in, in the West wants to help Iranians, it should open any channel that they could have an impact on uh, public opinions in this country or in Europe. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we've come to the end of the time for today's webinar. I, I could go on with many, many more questions, and I'm so very happy to be able to tell a, a, a story of optimism today, or at least maybe not unbridled optimism, but there is hope. And I want to thank all of our viewers today and ask them to be on the lookout for webinar offerings that will be sent out in the next few days. Thank you so much, and thank you very much, Dr. Mohammadi. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're very welcome.